welcome, Greek U Nation, to episode number 445 of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Eilon, CEO of Greek University. I'm a speaker and an author. Our fifth book just came out. It's called Perseverance and How to Be a Great Fraternity or Sorority Alumnus. So go and pick up that book on Amazon or Barnes & Noble today. We call these episodes the Fraternity Foodie Podcast because there is nothing like great food to bring college students together. Fun fact, if you haven't visited Pittsburgh before, I would highly recommend going to see it. It is an absolutely beautiful city filled with great universities, great students, including Carnegie Mellon. And don't miss Promonti Brothers for a delicious sandwich, especially since a fraternity brother of mine is the CEO of the company. We have to support our fe fellow fraternity brothers out there doing great work and making delicious sandwiches. Speaking of Pittsburgh, let's talk to our next guest. Mike Starr managed a successful $100 million manufacturing business. He's an avid adventurer who climbed Mount Kilimanjaro and canoed 54 days from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. He is an executive life coach, a former nuclear trained submarine officer, and a seasoned problem solver. Mike empowered dozens of business improvement teams with one simple question to clarify, identify obstacles, and implement lasting solutions. He graduated from Carnegie Mellon University with a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering. He is an active uh, member of NAMI and the Al-Anon communities, and he has been married for 44 years, living in Conway, Arkansas. Welcome to the show, Mike. Welcome. Well, thank you there, Michael. It's an honor to be here today. Well, thank you so much for joining us. You are a worldly traveler and you are a seasoned problem solver. So right away, you have a spot on the Greek University Fraternity Foodie podcast. I love talking to our guests about their college experience. And you went to a fantastic institution for your undergraduate experience, Carnegie Mellon University with a degree in electrical engineering. I'm sure that you could have chosen many places to go to school. So why did you ultimately decide on Carnegie Mellon? It really is kind of simple is um, I came from very humble uh, background. And so my, uh, I guess my sight and vision of what was possible was somewhat limited. So I only applied to three colleges, Penn State, University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon. I was accepted to all of them. I got some degree of a scholarship from all three of them. But um, I believe that uh, Carnegie Mellon, which at that time was in uh, in uh, in the process of changing its name from Carnegie Tech to Carnegie Mellon. So I was there the first year to change its name over. I, I believe they had uh, uh, the best education and they also had uh, put a lot of focus on academics. They had de-emphasized uh, athletics uh, decades prior to that. So I just thought it would be the best best place to to get the best education that wasn't too far away and within our economic uh, ability to support that. Yeah, that makes total sense. And I think for electrical engineering, I think you definitely made the right choice there. I mean, there's just some outstanding engineering students coming out of Carnegie Mellon. So I think that was the right choice. Although I do love the students at the University of Pittsburgh. That is a really, really nice place as well. So I don't want to demean them yes. because I like you guys. I really do. <laughs> and so as a college student, you know, the interesting story about you is, is that you and your friend canoed 1,850 miles from Pittsburgh to New Orleans. And you mentioned being with the same person 24 hours a day for 54 days straight. I'm sure that was very revealing in terms of an experience. So why did you do this canoe trip for 54 days with one other person? And what did you learn in the process? Well, this may not be the right message to send to your wonderful um, college audience, but sometimes being drunk is a good idea. And uh, we were at a we were at a New Year's party. I belonged to this Ukrainian club in uh, Carnegie Mellon, and I uh, had a fellow Ukrainian there. And we were pretty um, inebriated. And he spoke about how he tried to raft down the Ohio years before, and they failed. And he says, you know, canoeing might be interesting. And I says, yeah, that sounds like fun. And I've always been an adventurer, you know, jumping out of airplanes, cave exploring, just. I'm kind of game for almost anything. And so um, when we sobered up a couple of days later, I still thought it was a good idea. So we talked more about it and that uh, led us to uh, to begin our journey, which um, started right there at Point Park in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And I think about lessons learned there 
I think one lesson I learned was that, you know, the Roman armies often burnt their bridges behind them so that retreat was not an option. Uh, although at the time it wasn't maybe a conscious choice, but I can tell you when you've got a canoe loaded up with supplies and, and a tent and, and a portable 22 rifle and a few other things, there's no thought of turning back. So uh, failure was not an option. So I, I learned that sometimes in life, you just need to burn your bridges behind you. And, and then that really motivates you to go forward. And I think as far as uh, from an experiential point of view, one of the things, one of the many things that I learned is the value of having a routine, the value of having habits. You know, there's that old saying that in the first half, half of our life, we make our habits in the second half of our life, our habits make us. Our routines that we evolved into just made life a lot easier. Uh, Ron, who was the person that went with me, he would set up the tents, tear down the tents, he'd make the breakfast, and I would be tearing the canoe down with the stuff in it, putting it inside. So we had a sort of delegation of responsibilities that just we evolved into. And it made it somewhat seamless from the time we would land at late in the evening to the time that we would leave early morning about who was gonna do what, when and where. So routines and habits, other rather than, you know, uh, I guess basically shackling us, they actually free us so that we can do other things. And, and there's certain things we don't have to think about. We just do them, you know, unconsciously. Yeah. That's a really interesting thought about burning the bridges behind you. That's uh, you know, I hadn't heard that one, but it is kind of interesting. I think about, you know, my adventure and being an entrepreneur, you know, I, I was working in corporate America for a little while, was very dissatisfied with that for various reasons. Um, but, you know, quitting those jobs and basically just saying, you know what, I have, you know, six months worth of savings that I know that I can blow through. So even as an entrepreneur, if I don't make a single sale for six months, I'll still be fine. Um, and, you know, and having that runway really allowed me to quit the job, not look back and just say, I'm going to be successful as an entrepreneur. I'm going to give it everything that I have. And I think ultimately that's what led to success. But, you know, a lot of people might not be willing to leave those comforts of a corporate job with a consistent paycheck in order to really get, you know, that entrepreneurial experience um, and all the rewards that comes with being an entrepreneur. So it is kind of an interesting thought. Um, and I'm sure I've done that many times before to make sure that I didn't retreat. Um, <laughs> that's, that's an interesting one. Um, you know, and between graduation and the Navy, you took this hitchhiking odyssey for five months where you traveled to Fort Lauderdale, Mardi Gras, Houston, Mexico City, uh, San Cristobal, Guatemala City, Antigua, the Mayan pyramids, Lake uh, Atitlan, and back to Pittsburgh. And apparently you left with $80. You returned home with $2.15. You were working construction and day jobs along the way. I, you know, what was this hitchhiking odyssey like for you? It was really incredible. I uh, I didn't know where this all was going to go. A friend of mine and I, we uh, we did something called uh, driver ride, I, I think. We took this older couple's uh, black Fleetwood Cadillac and uh, we just put the gas in it and we got to drive it down to uh, Fort Lauderdale and deliver it to them at the airport. And from there, it was like, Let's see what happens. And so I would talk to Joe and he'd say, try this. And I talked to Mary, she'd try that. Who knew where it was going to all end up? <clears throat> so it was really absolute uh, total freedom. And uh, I mean, I had things like being in Tulane Stadium, taking a shower with 20 girls and 20 guys. Like, I didn't think that was going to be that way when I was there in Mardi Gras. So it, it was it was really um uh, it was incredible to go to Guatemala and see the colorful garments that the people wore there. Uh, I had a few dollars and I flew from Guatemala City into the jungles of the Yucatan. Um, and in on the process of that flight, I lost my fear of death. And that, that was a very fascinating and, and pivotal point in my life <clears throat> and ended up in uh, Tikal with where they would do the human sacrifices, take their hearts out and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it was just uh, amazing. And, uh, uh, but I, I will tell you the story about flying into, into the Yucatan is uh, here I am on this World War II uh, freight 
plane and I'm sitting actually on a wood seat like in the old schools and I got a rope around my waist with a little clasp like you'd use for your dogs. Um, and the co-pilot would come by and give you two chiclets. That was your precious uh, pressure equalization. So I'm sitting there and I got this cargo net in front of me and I'm looking out the window and I said, holy Moses, I am thousands and thousands and thousands of miles away. No one knew where I was. No one knew I was flying into the Yucatan. And I said, if we crash here, I, I'll either die or I'll never get rescued in time. And the fear in me, <clears throat> the anxiety in me, it was a crescendo. It reached such a point that something snapped in me. Uh, psychologically something snapped in my mind and from that point on i says you know there's a lot of things in life i've got no control over just go with it and i had this sense of release and relief and from that day forward i'll be honest with you i have really have no fear of death i mean i don't do crazy things not too crazy and uh so th that was one of the things I learned. And I guess another thing I learned, and I can go on on about that trip, which was just uh, remarkable, is I learned that there was a singer that you may know of, maybe a lot of college audiences not familiar with named Janis Joplin. Mm -hmm. And she was this iconic raspy voice, uh, uh, almost kind of seductive sing singer. <clears throat> she had our number one seller, which was called Me and Bobby McGee which became number one after she died. She got involved in drugs and a lot of bad lifestyle choices for her. And actually that song was written by Chris Christopherson, Chris Christopherson as a, oh, by the way. So the, the chorus line in that song is, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. And boy, did I get it on that trip. I had absolute freedom. I had no agendas. I go wherever I want. And there was a real feeling of angst, a real feeling of discomfort. I didn't like it, to be honest with you. As months went in, even of all the incredible things I saw, the Easter processions in Antigua and, and the, the, the old conquistador monasteries and all that stuff, I just felt at really at dis-ease. And a few months after I got home, I went into boot camp. Uh, with the Navy on my road to getting into some Marines. And that structure freed me up. And I realized I like structure and routine. I don't like this total freedom like Janice says. It's it's just another word for nothing left to lose. <laughs> that was just fascinating. And well, listen, thank you for your service there uh, in the Navy. You served on board the Fleet Ballistic Missile Submarine, the U.S. Kamahamaha. I can't even pronounce that. As <laughs> And, uh, you know, one of your responsibilities, you had highly classified documents in your duties as communications officer. You had a clearance that was a level above top secret. You know, how did your time in the Navy, I mean, how did that impact your life overall? In a way, in an indirect way, it um, I, I one of the takeaways I had from being on the USS Kamehameha, which is a mouthful, yes. uh, was that uh, when I came in, I was drafted in the Army, joined the Navy's enlisted. While I was in enlisted, I applied for officer's program, ended up going to Washington, D.C., interviewing with Rick Over. And so they put me through an accelerated program to become an officer and then a one-year training program to be on a nuclear submarine. Mm -hmm. But most, if not all, the officers on the submarine were from Annapolis. So they were professional, military trained uh, young men, and they, they knew a lot of the ins and outs of leadership, which I, I really wasn't that familiar with. And in the first, I say, few patrols, we had blue crew, gold crew. We'd go out. We would be submerged for 72 days. We'd come back in. The next crew would come over from the United States, and we'd swap roles. Uh, we were to remain detected as a strategic deterrent. Um, and I, I was I was failing on that ship. I, I was not a good leader. I was uh, not embraced by the crew in a lot of ways because of my own shortcomings. And I met a man who later on became a vice admiral. Uh, uh, he became, a, I guess, a... Um, consultant to several presidents, and he actually eventually ended up being my brother-in-law um, named Al Konetsny, and he had faith in me. He believed in me when I didn't believe in myself. And one of the things I learned is that 
not only to believe in yourself no matter what, but to believe in others and encourage them even when they may not believe in themselves and do it in a kind way. And it's because of his belief in me, I ended up being a fairly good officer on that submarine. So when I finally left, I was respected and I felt like I was a pretty good contributor to the team. Love it. Absolutely love it. You also believe that the foundation for success lies with conviction in our values and what we believe to be important, what we believe to be right and wrong for us. And I really, that really resonates for me because I know many of our listeners are in fraternities and sororities. We all have conviction in our values as well. Why do you believe that conviction in our values is so important for success? I think it's essential. Uh, it's absolutely pivotal in being able to, to some degree, guide your trajectory forward. You know, if you're on a trajectory, say you're on a ship and you're off by 10 degrees, after you go about 10,000 miles, you, you, you've, you've kind of missed your, your target by 1,000 miles almost, probably close to 800 miles or, or so. I am, the reason, one of the reasons I wrote the book is because of the, uh, what's going on in our cultures of uh, confusion and division. Um, there are so many narratives that are so conflicting. I, 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 to your sorority and fraternity, brothers and sisters, I don't know you, but I love you. And I know you're facing a very challenging time in trying to decide what's right and what's wrong. And, and how do you stand up for sometimes the right things without having the social mob, the, the lynch mob come and descend upon you? And so I, I think that in my coaching business, one of the things that part of my program is we spend usually a couple months developing what I call the 10 convictions. I have a state of being called be like Moses. You know, Moses came down with the 10 commandments. Hmm. I think we need rules. I think we need uh, guidelines. And so I work with my clients to develop these convictions. When you have clarity about who you believe in and what you believe in, like I always expect my clients to have number one conviction is be your word. And then they get to pick the next 10 or 11 or 12. Our decisions come so easily. Our, our second guessing of ourselves becomes so minimal. If you're not clear about what you believe in and who you are, you, you're constantly second guessing yourself. You're not sure what to do. And when you do something that didn't turn out right, you kind of second guess yourself, you beat yourself up. And, and sometimes you can stray from being ethical. Sometimes you can stray from having what I would call a high level of integrity. So it helps you live with integrity, have more peace of mind, not second guess yourself. And if there's anything I'm somewhat talented with it is getting results. It helps you get real sustainable, meaningful results. And the key word there is meaningful, that they really have significance in your long-term uh, view of life. Um, so those are, it's just figure out who you are, be true to yourself as you know Shakespeare says, mm -hmm. to thy own self be true, but take some time to figure out what those convictions are either with a coach or through a lot of contemplation. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's assume that we figure out who we are with a coach or through reflection. You also believe in confidence in our ability to be our word, our ability to believe that we will do what we say we are going to do. And the same thing I think is true for fraternity and sorority. If we don't actually do what we say we're going to do, which is, let's say, service, which is scholarship, for example, uh, philanthropy, et cetera, if we don't do those things and we do things that are contrary, um, then people are going to call us out in the media for that hypocrisy. So, you know, once we figure out who we are, how do we truly live that out every single day for a large group of people that made that same commitment? I mean, is there a system in order to hold us all accountable? Well, you're absolutely correct about how valuable that is. And um, we are our word. If you want to define yourself, you can have all kind of intentions. You can have all kind of illusions or delusions or views but what you are in the final analysis is what you speak you are. And uh, so it's part of a critical part of self-identity. 
And it's not only, not only is it important for other people to have respect for you and depend on you and count on you, which is if you're looking for a job to work for somebody, uh, that's a pretty high uh, prerequisite is they want to be able to count on you. They, I, I've had thousands of people working for me over the years, uh, managers, supervisors, crafts, union, non-union. And let me tell you, it is a real pleasure when I came across somebody that can ask them to do something, I can walk away and know it's done. Usually not. I'm usually following up. Well, where are you with this? And where are you with that? But on top of the value of people valuing you is something I call cognitive dissonance. I don't call it that in the area of psychology. They call it cognitive dissonance, where you think and believe one thing and what you do is something different. And if you start living your life in a way where you're doing things that are in opposition and conflict with your, your inner values, you're going to be messed up. You're going to feel uneasy. You're, you're going to have a lot of angst and anger. Uh, and you're not going to have peace of mind and you're not going to have a lot of joy. So if for no other reason, just to be, to like yourself, I, I will, my wife would be the second to tell you that the person that is my best friend and always has been my best friend is me. I'm my best friend. I, li I really like myself. And why? Because my behavior is something that I admire. But it took me a while <clears throat> to get there eventually because why do we like or dislike someone? Because of their behavior. In the end, it's really not about all the things that we see on social media about, you know, there's exaggerations about things related to ethnicity and, and all that. I, I think in the end, it's about behavior. So if you behave in alignment with what you believe and you're clear that your beliefs are solid and of integrity, you're going to like yourself. Mm -hmm. And part of liking yourself, a big part is being your word. And when you get to that point, there's something called self-efficacy, the believing in your ability to do things. You will find that you can speak things into existence. You know if you speak it, it's going to happen. That's a pretty powerful place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head there. I think it's really all about our actions. You know, we can all say certain things, you know, creeds and mottos and other things in the beginning of a, a meeting. But the question is, what are you actually doing? Because that's what people are going to judge you on. It's your actions. Do your actions actually match what your values are? Uh, yes or no. And so ultimately, I think that's how people are judging us. And I think you're right about it. Um, you also believe in empowering shifts in our views of self and world around us through the use of language. Why do you believe language is so important? Well, I've spent 25 years really following that line of thinking. And in the last 10 years writing, um, I wrote this uh, book here, which is on the wall here, Journey into Peace, a Language for Peace, Progress, and Healing. In a nutshell, if, I mean, what do we use language for? We use it for communicating with ourself and with others. And we use it for thinking, problem solving, identifying the reality. If we improve our thinking, we improve our perceptions. If we improve our perceptions, we improve our ability to respond to the realities around us and we improve our ability to make decisions. You know, one of the problems that I see with my clients and even in my personal life, is that there is this propensity or tendency to fight reality. Uh, I don't believe in resigned acceptance. I mean, it exists, and it's kind of not such a hot place to be, but I do believe in, in wisely empowered acceptance, where we accept reality for where it is. Hey, there's quicksand over here. There's a wall over here. There's a rock over there. If you accept reality for what it is, you can navigate your way around those obstacles and those problems. I'm a big sci-fi fan, and there's a series called Star Trek The Next Generation with John Luke Picard and his crew. Um, and their nemesis was this enemy called the Borg, which was this cube floating through space, and they would assimilate societies. And there was a saying that the Borg had, resistance is futile. When it comes to reality, resistance is futile. And whether it's dealing with relationships, whether it's dealing with addiction, I'm involved with 
Al-Anon, which is Families of Alcoholics, NAMI, which is National Alliance for Mental Illness. I do a lot of relationship coachings with people and couples and, uh, and such. And a, a lot of the problems really, it goes back to kind of two basic things. One, people don't like themselves and they project that unhappiness onto other. And the other one is they're unwilling or incapable of seeing reality for what it is and learning to navigate around that reality. They so want a different reality, they, they won't allow the objective reality to come forward. And as a result, they're always walking off of cliffs or walking into walls or doing as you know Einstein said, insanity, doing the same thing over and again, doing different results. As we change our language, embedded in words in our language are, are self-fulfilling prophecies. Unfriendly leads us one direction, like I initially saw my my rescue dog is unfriendly. And then I saw, no, maybe he's just insecure. Maybe he was just abused before he was rescued. Maybe it's baked in his DNA. That simple example with my dog, when I approach Rippy as insecure and afraid, I approach him kindly, slowly, and and we our relationship has improved. But if I saw him as just unfriendly, it puts him in a binary box of all bad and all good. And and with human beings, it, it discounts the humanity of people and the mosaic and the tapestry of all the roles we have as fathers, as sons, as neighbors, as uh, religious leaders, uh, as fraternity brothers or sorority sisters. It discounts all that. It's just this sort of binary thing. And then we get into the whole deal of contra identities. Our identity becomes... I'm opposed to you. I'm good because you're bad. I my identity is based on the fact is you're inferior and inadequate. You know, I, let's talk a little bit more about your book. It's called Journey into Peace. In there, you promote this way of living. It's a philosophy that you call betterism. What exactly is betterism? Um, I'll, I'll I'll try to be short here. Betterism is at the at the core of it is about seeking and pursuing. I claim that let's not look at goals as a destination. You know, when I climbed Kilimanjaro, I was I was actively choosing that it wasn't just getting to the top of Kilimanjaro. It was also having the process of preparing to go get to Kilimanjaro. So part of betterism is to see that a goal is a combination of the journey plus the destination. And you wanna have a healthy journey and a meaningful destination. And so in betterism, you you balance that. You know, that saying, I climbed the ladder of success, only reached the top, realized that my ladder was against the wrong wall. I say wrong conclusion. Probably it was a pretty good choice of where you wanted to get to, but along the way, you didn't have a balanced, healthy life. At least I've seen many people not do that. So betterism is about that constant improvement and finding a way to be better. It's also about win-win and realizing that for us to succeed, the people around us need to succeed. It's about using the wise, empowering language, avoiding, avoiding dangerous language and useless language, like forgiveness. Forgiveness is not a doable verb. You can't achieve anything with the word forgiveness, but you can through understanding. And so it's about using the right language. It's you, having that win-win concept. It's about being the stream. I have these states of being where a stream only exists in movement forward. If the stream stops moving, not a stream anymore. It's a dry creek bed or a pond or something. But so living in the movement. And there's a whole host of being things like being the umbrella opener that when reality occurs around us, we just open the umbrella up and we have our boundaries to deal with it in a dispassionate manner. So it's about a way of empowering ourselves, empowering others, and most of all, having empathy for people with something I call newt, the natural order things that given the DNA, the experience, the socioeconomic upbringing of people, they couldn't help becoming who they became. In fact, it was inevitable they became who they became, whether it's an alcoholic or whether they became CEO. And by accepting that, now we can set boundaries with consequences and we can navigate with them or around them as, as necessary. And it takes all the drama out of disliking somebody or hating somebody or being jealous about them because it was inevitable it'd become as it became. Hmm. You know, I guess the, the one question is, is that we can be better for a day, right? Students could perhaps do a community service event. Let's say they go to a church, uh, you know, maybe they feed the, the hungry. 
Um, but that's one day, right? So how can college students design habits and routines that they weave into their day uh, living every day to day that makes their ongoing journey of being better effortless and automatic where it's repeated every day? Great question. Well, first of all, I'd say buy my book, Journey into Peace, and study it. Read it four or five times. Uh, and that's what it was intended to do. It wasn't intended to be an entertaining thing, but there's a lot of stories in there. Mm -hmm. But I have in the book, I talk about three sacred habits. So I would encourage your audience to consider these three sacred habits. They're called sacred because they're like non-negotiable. None. Number one, have a streamlined morning routine that you do every day. 30 minutes, 15 minutes, 45 minutes, a streamlined morning routine. And I give examples of what that routine would include. But one of the things it includes is your one or two areas for improvement that you've come up with for that month or, or that, that period of time, morning routine. The second thing is have a weekend review meeting with yourself. Now with my coaching folks, I have a meeting with them once a week, but you certainly can do it for yourself. Have a week in review meeting, say, hey, what worked? What didn't work? What's important? What do I want to work on? And the last thing is what I call the follow-up setback system. Have a record, <clears throat> whether it be on your phone or a pad, that when you have a setback, a mistake, because mistakes are our friend, it's part of what I call evolutionary learning uh, and learning experiences for growth, I call them legs. Write it down in your FUS log. And then in your weekend review meeting, say, okay, I had this, I had this setback mistake. Is that something I want to work at? And you say, well, it's an anomaly. It's an outlier on statistical curve, not worth it. Or yeah, I, I keep having this problem with my wife or my girlfriend or with this particular class. And so then you integrate some kind of small daily activity each and every day, and you put it into your morning routine. So that's a whole integrated thing, morning routine, which, which I, you do things what I call I steps, intentional, simple, tiny efforts of progress. And then you have the weekly week and review what worked, what didn't work, what do I want to put into my morning routine each day for five or 10 minutes. And then you have your fuss log so that when, when the poop hits the fan or something bad happens, you don't get caught up in a would have, could have, should have, and, and get, you know, kind of stagnated. You say, oh, I'll put that in the fuss log. I'll review that in my um, my week in review. So I, I encourage those three sacred habits as a great way to sustain continuous improvement and feeling good that you're doing about as good as you can do. I love that. That is a great practice. I hope that all of our listeners actually implement that for themselves. I think that they're going to make great progress if they do that uh, every single week, every single day uh, in terms of the habits. I think it's wonderful. Now, we do love good food here at the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. And so the next time that I'm in Conway, Arkansas, you know, you might not have Promonte Brothers there. It's not Pittsburgh. You know, I get it. But where should we go for a great meal? Okay, three places. Number one, there's a uh, it's kind of a New Orleans setting inside. It's called, you could remember it this way because you're Mike and I'm Mike. It's called Mike's Place. Ah, Very yeah. nice place in <laughs> Conway. I highly recommend it for steaks and certain seafoods. It, it's it really nice. There's another one called the Mighty Crab, which has great seafood. Uh, if you like snow crab, lobster, king crabs, um, the shrimp, mussels. In fact, they'll serve it in a big plastic bubble and they come out with this plastic bubble that's full of steam on this platter and then they bur they shake it up, burst it open and they dump it on your plate. So, and it's really beautiful atmosphere inside. It's something like almost Florida and hard to believe in Arkansas. And the third place, if you or your sorority or, or, or fraternity brothers do end up in Conway, the third place is come over my house. I make a great hamburger or hot dogs, chicken, and I make some good um, scallops and catfish too. So you're invited to come over. I love having people over. We'll sit around the pool. We'll have a beer if you're so inclined and we'll have a great meal together. That sounds like a great plan. Hey, listen, anytime you're cooking, I'm uh, I'm coming over. So that sounds like a wonderful plan. Next time I'm in Arkansas, I will certainly let you know. And uh, Mike's Place is real easy to remember and uh, snow crabs all the way. Uh, I'm surprised they have them in Arkansas, but hey, I'm willing to give it a yeah. shot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So if our listeners, if they want to buy your book, uh, you know, or they want to sign up for coaching for example, where should they go in order to connect with you? 
Well, the book's on Amazon. You can get it on paperback or Kindle. It's uh, Journey into Peace, a language for peace, progress, and healing. But just look Journey into Peace by Michael M. Starr. So you could buy it there. My coaching is under my website, executivecoachingservices.net, executivecoachingservices.net. And I would say that if any of your listeners were to sign up and say the next month, I'd give them a student discount, assuming they were students of 50% off, and throw in a free book. You know, I like making some money. It, it doesn't hurt. I'm, I'm in a position in my life where I don't need it. Um, uh, but I really love helping people. And I love helping young people because what if I could impact a young person to improve their trajectory by 10 degrees, the uh, it becomes a force multiplier. And they will impact their families, their loved ones, and their communities in the future. So, yeah, 50% off if you sign up. The only thing is I don't do more than five people at a time. It takes a lot of energy out of me to, to really give up my all. So first five people, 50% off if you're one of your audience and they're a student. Um, I would say executivecoachingservices.net. Check it out. Check out the website. He's going to give you 50% off. Just mention that you're a student and you heard about it on the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. And Michael will take care of that. Definitely go on to Amazon and pick up his book. It's called Journey into Peace. You can look that up by his author name, Michael Starr, and it's S-T-A-R-R. Um, so definitely go and check that out. Michael, you've shared some great information with us today. I love the habits. I think it's fantastic. I think doing that analysis every week to figure out what went well, what didn't go well every single week, I think is exactly what our students need to be doing. So thank you for sharing this great information with us today. You're welcome. And thank you, for Michael. I think providing some new ideas and views for the college community is uh, is a, a remarkable and much needed, um, uh, I guess, narrative and communication needed today. And I really appreciate what you're doing to help them have maybe some alternative views than the ones maybe they're exposed to in the in the academia world. Yeah, that's you know kind of the goal. I want them to you know have a free resource that's available to them for the next 500 years to go back and listen to these interviews and see what they can pick up from it. I think it's incredibly important. I'm really designing what I needed as an undergraduate student and what a what a great resource that would be to have all of these professionals to kind of listen to for 30 minutes to talk about what it is that they do best. And, you know, really young people, make sure you go out and find mentors, people that have been there and have done that all too often. I see young people kind of leaning on other students uh, for advice. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like find a mentor because there yes. are mentors out there that are in your niche, that are in your industry, that have been there and done that. They want to give back. People like you and I who've had success, they just want to give back and make the next generation better. So go out and seek them. I guarantee you as a college student, they will set up a meeting with you. It might not be today just because we're busy, but they will set up a meeting with you and they will help you because as a college student, you have nothing to sell them. You just want to improve your life. That's it. Yes, yeah. You know, so so True. that's a beautiful thing. <laughs> Thanks. Yes, thank you. And to our listeners, if you enjoyed this conversation with Michael Starr today, I want you to like it and share it with other college students that need to hear his words. Go and pick up that book. It's called Journey Into Peace. And we will see you on another episode of the Fraternity Foodie Podcast. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.